Hello again, this is Kevin with Custom Micro, and today we're going to do a walkthrough of the graphical user interface of the FS.com S3410-48TS-P Layer 2 Plus 48 port network switch. Let's do it. The default IP address of the switch when you unbox it is 192.168.1.1. So configure your network adapter to be on the same VLAN and then pull up your favorite web browser and navigate to that IP address. When you first log in, it'll have you change the default password. I've already done that, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. Once you log in, you're greeted with a nice graphical interface and there's a lot of options for us to look at. Let's start with the bar at the top. We see we have our model listed. We can click on detail and it gives us some information like start time, run time, hardware version, and software version. Obviously, run time is very useful if you think there's been a power outage or something along those lines. Over here on the right side, we have a wizard. If you want a very basic configuration just to get you going, maybe you need to change the IP range um, and the IP address of the switch to match your network. You can change the management, um, the default VLAN 1 management IP um, here subnet mask, gateway, DNS, even set your time zone, etc. Some unique things here, if you click on service, it actually takes you to the fs.com site where you can get support if you have technical support needs. If we go back, if you click on more, there's an option for firmware download, which will take you to the fs.com site for technical documentation for network switches in this series. And you can find um, technical documents, data sheets, even downloads. Also, it's worth mentioning at this point that if you purchase this switch, you can go and you can subscribe so you're notified anytime there's firmware or software updates for this switch. That can be very useful as FS is often updating the graphical interface or making bug fixes and changes. And so you always want to make sure you're running the latest firmware of these switches. Back to the switch itself. Of course, you can log out. So when you log into the switch, you're greeted by the favorites tab or navigation on the left side. And under favorites, we start off with home. We have useful information like our CPU usage, memory usage, the number of ports that are up. Right now, it's just the port that I'm plugged into, current date and time, runtime, and your model, software version, device Mac, etc. We can see there's also port information just below that where we see right now only port one is connected and even gives you how many packets have been sent and received. It can be very useful. If we go on down to VLAN, that's the next section under favorites. You can see I've already created some VLANs. Um, you have the standard VLAN one that comes out of the box. And then I have previously created VLAN 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 207. And you can uh, go in and edit these, and you can change um, some of the information about um, very simply. You can actually um, decide what ports are untagged um, on these VLANs, which is, can be helpful for sure. So, for example, if we wanted to tag VLAN 10 on port 48, we can just simply select it and click Save. This would be a good time to mention that port 47 and 48 are combo ports sometimes known as dual personality ports. So for example, if you plug a one gig SFP transceiver into port 47 and you're actively using that port, the ethernet port 47 will be disabled. So make sure you're aware of that. This does not affect port 49 and 50, which are your SFP plus ports, your 10 gig transceiver ports. Those are not combo ports. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at buying this switch. So back to our VLAN settings, we can also easily set trunk ports, which is nice. Notice you, you can set your native VLAN and then your allowed VLANs. So for example, if you wanted the native VLAN of the switch to be VLAN 10, and then you wanted the allowed VLANs to be 20, 30, 40, 50, then you could set those settings and then you could pick a port on the switch and click save, and it will apply those VLAN changes to that port. So this is a really nice way to um, manage your switch. Very intuitive. 
simple to use. But let's move on. We've covered VLAN section pretty thoroughly. So we'll, we'll move on and we'll look at voice VLAN. Here we can set our VLAN number of our voice VLAN for our voice over IP phones. So next to status, we have OUI. This is a really nice feature. So we can click add OUI and you can put the manufacturer part of the MAC address here. And so when you plug that phone into the network, it will automatically be detected as a voice device and it will automatically assign that to the proper voice VLAN. You also have an interface section where you can enable or disable the voice VLAN feature on that port. The next section under favorites is port. Here we can set up our layer three ports. Again, this is a layer two plus switch, so it does include some layer three functions. You can see I've already created some examples, VLAN 10, 20, and 207. We have the IP address and the subnet mask of those. These are basically interface VLANs. These are routed VLANs. Then we see below that our layer two ports, and we can see information about whether the port is up or down, um, enabled or disabled, you can look at it that way. And then also the access VLAN, native VLAN, and the VLANs that are permitted. You can always edit this over here by clicking edit. You can basically um, shut that port down. We can set the, the mode to access port, trunk port, or L3 port. We can set the native VLAN and we can set the allowed VLAN. So in this example, VLAN 10 will be untagged and VLAN 30 will be tagged because it is an allowed VLAN. There are some advanced settings here where you can set that interface, your link speed and duplex manually. That can be helpful sometimes if the switch or device on the other end has those settings set manually. So you can set it for 10, 100, or gigabit, and you can set to full or half duplex. The next tab under port is aggregate port. This is where you can aggregate two or more network interfaces together. This can be extremely useful if you have a server or a NAS. For example, maybe you want to have multiple one gig interfaces that are all connected. You can create an aggregate port group and you can have multiple connections. That's good for resiliency in case one connection has a, a link failure, maybe a cable failure and also can be beneficial because it increases the bandwidth between those devices. So this is where you would set those aggregate port groups. We also have port mirroring. So if you um, want to mirror a port, in essence, capture packets from that port, maybe using Wireshark or something along those lines, because you want to be able to monitor the traffic on a particular port, you can enable port mirroring and you can uh, monitor all packets or only inbound or outbound packets. The next section is rate limiting. This is a very nice feature of the switch. At the port level, you can limit the input and output rate, kind of set a speed limit on the port or interface, if you will. The next section under favorites is PoE settings. Here at the port level, we can click edit. We can enable or disable PoE. We can set the priority to low, high, critical, or default. And we can set the max power all the way up to a maximum of 36 watts. This can be very handy because occasionally network switches will not identify your PoE devices properly. They may not put them in the right class and so it may not be supplying enough power. So if you know what class device you have and what its PoE rating is, you can set your cap of the wattage of that interface appropriately. There's also global settings for PoE. You see here, we see our total power budget this switch has two 370 watt power supplies, but I'm currently only using one power supply. Only one is plugged in, and so that limits our power budget. You can also set a power saving mode and enable or disable a non-standard mode. The next section under favorites is SSH. You have your global configuration, your authentication timeout, for example. You have the keys that you can set, public and private key pairs, if you want to use those for your SSH sessions versus username and password. And then here you can assign those to a particular user. So that can be very handy. Right now, SSH is not enabled. You just simply check the box and click apply. And then last under favorites, you can restart the switch. Our next section on the left navigation is network. 
And then from there, the first part of network is MAC address. Let's take a look at that. You notice there's some nice hints here or notes that explain what these settings will do. A lot of this has to do with your port security in ways that you can allow traffic through those ports. The next tab over is filtering for filtering address settings, and it gives a similar description. I'm just explaining what that is and how you can utilize that on the network switch. Let's go down to the next section, which is routing. Again, it's nice that this switch does support a lot of layer three functionality. You can create static routes, you can add a default route, or you can delete selected routes. I've already created one example here of a route, and it basically tells you what the next hop is if you want to get to the 10.25.10 network or subnet. The next section under network is spanning tree protocol. You can enable that globally by just a toggle of this but radio button. You have spanning tree port settings. So you can edit spanning tree at the port level. You can enable or disable port fast, BDP UGuard, connection mode, etc. You can set a priority, a lot of those common features. You also have the, your RLDP settings here and that's a global setting. Notice here it says RLDP enables you to detect link failure quickly. RLDP can run on the port only after it is enabled globally. So if you want to use this feature, you, you have to enable it globally first before you can enable it at the port level. The next section under networking is IGMP snooping. Again, the notes here are very handy, especially if you're a novice to networking. You can understand what these features are and how they might be useful to you. And they're very accurate. Notice it says on layer two devices, multicast frames are flooded to all ports, causing storm and consuming much bandwidth. IGMP snooping is used to find out on which port there is an IGMP subscriber and only send IGMP traffic to that port so as to save bandwidth. So you can enable this feature and it kind of gives you a little synopsis of what that feature does. The next one is DHCP relay. This one's pretty common feature that people will use. Let's say you decide not to use the built-in DHCP server, which we'll look at later, and you would rather use a DHCP server on a domain controller or another networking device. You can set up and enable DHCP relay, add your DHCP server, and in essence, this is your helper IP address. So devices that will be plugged into the switch will be able to um, more easily find the DHCP server with that helper IP address. The last section in our network is authentication. This is a pretty neat section. Here you could set up something like a radius server for authentication of devices that are plugged into the different ports on the switch. So you can set the server IP, redirection URL. There's also a section here or link for radius server settings. We we'll go back here. There's different types of portals, etc. There's also an advanced section where you can set your HTTP session count, redirect timeout, etc. It is possible, I'm misunderstanding what the use of this section is. It also possibly could be simply just to allow you to use something like a radius server for authentication of the web interface of the switch. So if you know the answer to that, feel free to add a comment down below and um, we'll learn something together. So that covers our web interface walkthrough of the FS.com model S3410-48TS-P. You're going to want to stay tuned because we're going to have more videos to come about this switch. We're also going to have the command line walkthrough and we have a special stacking video coming up. So you want to subscribe to our channel, ring that bell so you're notified when those videos go live. Thank you for watching. We'll catch you next time.